Welcome everyone. Today is May 15th, 2014. Our webinar topic is Electrospinning Polymer Fibers. I'm your host, Michael Secchi. You'll see today that this is a simple technique of introducing nanoscience to undergraduates. Now this webinar is brought to you by the NAC Network. The network was established at the Penn State College of Engineering and it is funded in part by a grant from the National Science Foundation. We gratefully acknowledge that support. I'm your host today. I work at Maytech Networks. You can see them on the bottom of the screen. And we collaborate with the NAC Network to produce this webinar series. Let's begin by introducing our presenter today. Dr. Nicholas Pinto is a professor in the Department of Physics and Electronics at the University of Puerto Rico, the Umacao campus that's on the southeast coast of the island of Puerto Rico. As you can see, his research is in the field of conducting polymers, and we're going to hear a lot about that today, conducting polymers for use as gas sensors and devices, and thinking about an interesting topic called organic electronics at the nanoscale. Dr. Pinto is also engaged in a, a number of efforts to integrate undergraduate research into the uh, programs there at UPR. Dr. Pinto, welcome today. Go ahead and press your talk button and say hello to the audience. Hello, uh, hello Mike. Uh, hello, everyone. I hope uh, you can hear me clearly. I would say your voice is a little faint, but not too bad. I'll remind our participants that they can turn up their own listening volume uh, as you speak today, Dr. Pinto. Uh -huh. Let me ask you a question before we begin. How did you get interested in this field of nanotechnology? Well, it started in the, in, in 2000, uh, you know, when then President Clinton uh, had this nanotechnology initiative. And then the, uh, the University of Puerto Rico at Macau had a collaboration with, uh, with the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. And that's where I was introduced uh, to one of the professors uh, who basically discovered conducting polymers. And he was involved in trying to get nanofibers of the conducting polymers that he discovered. So that's how I got introduced uh, to this very simple technique called electrospinning. And it's, uh, I've continued in that area. And a lot of the students, including high school students, uh, come to my lab. And, uh, and that's how we started uh, to get involved in this very exciting field of nanotechnology. That, that's really good, uh, Nick. I know there's a lot of chemistry coming up today, so I want to encourage participants to hold on to their seats as we get into the various chemical aspects. I have to admit I like those myself. Nick, I'm going to turn over the floor to you. You're now in charge of advancing the presentation, and, and go ahead and take us forward. Well, thanks, Mike, again. Uh, so my name is uh, Nick Pinto, and uh, I'm at the University of Puerto Rico at Macau. And the title of my presentation is uh, Electrospinning Polymer Fibers, a simple technique of introducing nanoscience to undergraduates. Uh, and as I said uh, before, we, uh, we got into this about uh, 13 or 14 years ago, uh, trying, to, trying to get uh, nanofibers of conducting polymers. And as I will show in a, in a few minutes, uh, this technique called electrospinning, perhaps uh, some of you are, are are familiar with this technique. It's a really very simple technique to get uh, polymer fibers, okay? And then depending on, on the solution and how much and how viscous it is, you can actually get fibers that are in the nano regime. So when I say nano, what I mean is uh, anything below 100 nanometers, okay? One nanometer is 10 to the minus 9 of a meter. And so the, the electrospinning technique, uh, basically, uh, once you have it running, uh, it produces a lot of nanofibers. And you can collect uh, a lot of them within seconds. But the focus of my research has been to use uh, just one nanofiber, or perhaps two, as you can see in this, uh, on the background of this slide, where you have two nanofibers that basically intersect right over here. And then our focus has been to try and uh, electrically characterize these nanofibers. And since we measure the current flowing through a nanofiber, these polymers that we, that we study are basically metallic or perhaps even semiconducting. And the idea is to 
isolate one or two of these fibers and then put electrodes on it and uh, try and make a device or try and make a sensor. So that's what the focus is uh, in my lab. So we are an undergraduate institution, so we have undergraduate students only. And a lot of the times, uh, these students have uh, classes that students take anywhere from 15 to 22 credits. So they don't, they don't have too many hours consecutive to do the experiment. And so these experiments that we do are, have to be simple so they can get it completed in one semester. So for those of you who are not familiar, and I see that there are folks from all over the world, uh, to give you an idea where Puerto Rico is, it's right over there in the Caribbean, about uh, a thousand miles or southeast of Miami. And Umacao is, as Mike mentioned, uh, on the southeast of the island. Uh, here are some of the conducting polymers uh, and metal oxides also that we have studied. Remember that a polymer is a big, uh, a big molecule, okay? And so, and these polymers, when people talk of polymers, they, they generally think of plastics. And a plastic typically does not conduct electricity. So for example, a grocery bag would not con conduct electricity. But this one over here, a polyaniline of PE dot, polyethylene dioxythiophene, or poly 3 hexothiophene these are all polymers that conduct electricity because they have free charge that can move along the backbone of the polymer. And if you see to the right, uh, over here we see the electronic structure of these polymers. Basically, uh, they are conjugated, which means that they have a lot of double bonds, as you can see over here. And the important part of this electronic structure that gives it all of its electronic properties comes from this uh, bonding, anti-bonding pi pi star overlap, okay? So that's the important part of the electronic spectrum. The inline or the in-plane bonds of the sigma and the sigma star are quite high up or quite low in energy that they do not contribute to. And the interesting thing in these polymers is that any defect that you would find, for example, along these polymer chains, any of these defect states would lie in the bonding or anti-bonding orbitals, energy, energy levels, and so they do not affect uh, the electronic properties of these conducting polymers which is one reason why you can use these conducting polymers and make reasonably good devices out of them under ordinary lab conditions. If you were to work with silicon, then you would have to use a clean room, for example. So here are some of the polymers that we work with. Uh, we have synthesized some of these polymers, but typically if they are available commercially, then we basically just purchase it and, and use it in our lab. The next slide shows you the conductivity of these electronic polymers. And for example, why would one want to use polymers if you have copper or silver that has such a high conductivity? Okay, here's the conductivity in Siemens per centimeter. And 10 to the power 6 is the conductivity of typical metals. But you go over here and you see polyaniline or polyacetylene has a conductivity of 1,000. So what is the, the benefit of using a polymer that conducts electricity if you have metals that conduct even better? And the key thing over here is that conducting polymers, first of all, you can synthesize them in the lab. So that's important. They're cheap, they're flexible, they can be made transparent, and most importantly, they can be doped. For example, you see over here polyaniline in the emeraldine base form that's in the insulating form, has a conductivity of 10 to the minus 10 Siemens per centimeter. And then you can dope it uh, up to 1,000 Siemens per centimeter. So you can control the conductivity of polyaniline anywhere in this range over here, something that you would not be able to do with a metal. And for our purposes, since it's a polymer, we can then make polymer nanofibers using this very simple technique called electrospin. So what is this technique called electrospin? It was discovered several decades ago, actually in the 1930s. But it became popular only three or four decades ago. And to get, a, typically, for example, if you wanted to get a fiber or a wire out of a metal, what you would do is you would uh, heat the metal up 
into a liquid state and then push it through a dye and then cool the cool the wire that comes out of the dye. So that extrusion typically leads to fibers or wires that are several hundreds of microns thick. Whereas well, over here we have a rather simple technique called electrospinning, and that's the entire apparatus. All you need is a hypodermic needle, a high voltage power supply, and a grounded cathode, which typically could be an aluminum foil. So let's say that you wanted to make nanofibers of polyanilin. So polyanilin in its doped state can be dissolved in chloroform. So if you, if you dope polyanilin with, let's say, camphor sulfonic acid and you dissolve it in chloroform, you can make a solution. Uh, you can add a little bit of PEO. Typically, we add about a few milligrams of PEO to give it the right consistency. And then you put it in this hypodermic needle. Uh, this hypodermic needle is then placed on a syringe pump. So you can basically push on the piston at a controlled rate. Uh, a rate that let's say, so this is, uh, what I use over here is, a, is an insulin syringe, so it's not very big. And you have a drop that falls off every once in 15 seconds, for example. And so if you did not connect this voltage to the needle, the drop would basically just fall all the way down over here via gravity. But when you connect a, a voltage to this needle, and the negative part you connect to a cathode, and then you increase the voltage. There comes a time when the electric force at the tip of the needle on the drop that's about to fall overcomes the surface tension. And then you would get this uh, spiral that shoots out from the needle towards the cathode. And so you, you would have a sudden evaporation of the solvent, and what you get over here would be a deposit of fibers. Yeah. Nick, I want to interrupt with, with a question, yeah. if I could. Um, this is a, a very okay. fascinating technique, isn't it? It's simple, and yet it, it works. It, is viscosity an important issue here of the solution? And, and how do you can control it? I mean, can you add other things like oil to the polymer to control viscosity, or do you just accept the native viscosity of the polymer? So the viscosity has to be controlled, and so that would depend on the on the molecular weight of the polymer that you use, on the amount of solvent that you use. You do not want to use a polymer that has a very small molecular weight. The reason we form these fibers is because uh, if, if the polymer is long enough, then it gets entangled with one another. So you can think of spaghetti getting entangled, and then when you pull it apart, it doesn't quite fall apart. It just stays entangled, and that gives you the, the fiber. So viscosity is an important factor. So you don't want to put oil in it. Now, oil is not good because oil does not evaporate. So the solvent that you use should be a low boiling point solvent, uh, typically chloroform or THF, uh, somewhere around 60 centigrade, or even water. Because if the solvent does not evaporate, then as the solution comes out of the jet, what you get over here would be droplets. You just get droplets of oh, sure, polymer, sure. and then when you dry it, you would get a thin fill. So it's important to have a, 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 a solvent that would evaporate. And chloroform works well, good. Uh, well, works thank you. Fine. Yeah, thank you for uh, for the answer there. I want to remind our attendees, uh, Nick, that they can put their questions in, and then I'll, I'll stop you occasionally and bring those forward if that's okay. Yeah, it's fine. it's fine. I'm not sure if I can look over there also. I think I'll leave that to you. Yeah, leave that uh, to me. I'll do the looking over there. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay. So then uh, the question becomes, now what is this good for? Okay, so uh, we use it in our lab to get uh, single fibers, and then we, and I'll show you in a few seconds uh, what we do with these fibers. But this technique uh, is being used also in medicine. Uh, several years ago, I had a student who had a polymer in this uh, syringe, and then we dissolve an antibiotic in it. And so basically when she electrospun the polymer, you would get a deposit of polymer fibers together with the antibiotic. So one, one simple, uh, simple use of this or simple application of this technique is to cover a wound, for example, without, without touching it. It can be used as scaffolds. It can be used to create artificial skin. So there are many uses in biology for this technique. Uh, 
in my experiments, we need just one fiber, okay? So as you can see over here, from the tip of the needle to the cathode, a distance of about 15 to 20 centimeters, you get several fibers. And how does one get a single fiber? So to get a single fiber, what I do is I take a substrate, and then in the space between the tip of the needle and the aluminum foil, I take the substrate and I quickly go down in a very fast downward sweeping action. Okay, and that uh, gives me a few fibers on the substrate. So let's uh, move ahead and I'll show you. Uh, here, for example, is an old setup that we had of this electro spinning apparatus. As you can see, there's nothing to it. A power supply over here, the aluminum foil pasted onto this cardboard box, and here's a negative uh, wire that goes and connects to the aluminum foil over here. It's connected to the ground of this power supply. The positive of this power supply that comes from here is connected uh, is connected to this. This is not even a syringe; it's just a pipette. So you see the pipette; it's it's positioned so it's slightly uh, downward. And then at the back, you insert a copper wire. So you have a copper wire, and the alligator clip connects to the copper wire over here, and your pipette is filled with your solution. So you have gravity that is pushing the solution out, and then you increase your voltage over here. And if you can see clearly, if you can see on this slide, there are fibers bridging the tip of this pipette and the aluminum foil, as you will see now in the next slide. You see these fibers over here. So it's really full of fibers. And the fact that you can see them means that they are not nano. So that is what the electrospinning technique gives us. The tip of the needle or the tip of the pipette and the aluminum foil, and you have a whole bunch of fibers. <coughs> Excuse me. It turns out that if the polymer is conducting, this is what you get, the cobwebs of fibers that bridge the space between the tip of the needle and the aluminum foil. So each time you want to collect fibers, I would go with a ruler and basically remove all of this and then sweep my substrate to collect just one or two fibers. Uh, here is an uh, here is a, an SEM image of uh, polystyrene. Now, polystyrene is a polymer that's very common, uh, dissolved in tetrahydrofuran, and it has an average diameter of about 60 nanometers. So this was the very first experiments we did, and this is what you would see on the on the aluminum foil. Uh, long fibers of this polymer. Now polystyrene is a polymer that does not conduct electricity, so there was not much we could do with this uh, polymer. But in the next slide, I will show you uh, uh, what exactly we have done and the devices that we have made from some of these conducting polymers. Uh, here, for example, is a polymer polyvinylidene difluoride tri trifluoroethylene. So this is a ferroelectric polymer. Polyethylene, so that's PVDF over here, and this is P dot over here, and this is a conducting polymer. So this is a polymer that does not conduct. This is a polymer that conducts. And if you were to just dissolve this polymer in DMF, for example, over here as a one weight percent, and uh, three weight percent, excuse me, and you do the electro spinning of PVDF in DMF, you see that there are no fibers. Okay, so there are no fibers over here. You increase it to about five weight percent, and you begin to see indications of fibers being formed. So what we found is that if we really wanted to get fibers of this polymer, all we needed to do was add about one drop of PE dot, and that makes the solution a little conducting. It reduces the surface tension of the of the solution. And right over here, we can begin to see the beginnings of fibers being formed as you electrospin PVDF with one drop of PE dot in it. And certainly you can see in 5 weight percent. So this was very new because uh, in the past, all people did was uh, to get PVDF uh, fibers, they had to go to 10 or even 13 or even 20 weight percent of this polymer in DMF. But we were able to show that uh, we could get fibers even as low as 3 weight percent, and certainly as low as 5 weight percent. Uh, here, for example, is the seven weight percent without PE dot, seven weight percent with PE dot, nine weight percent without PE dot, 
nine weight percent with a drop of PE dot, etc. So you can see that PE dot really enhances the formation of these fibers. So these are fibers that we have produced in bulk. Nick, would you go back? So Nick, would you go back one slide for ah, a moment? Yeah. These are all at, uh, is that scale 10 microns for all of those? Yeah, I forgot to mention here. All of these scales over here oh, are 10 good. microns. So the scale on all, on all of these figures are, thanks Mike, Thank all you. of these scale bars are the same, right? So you can compare. So you can compare. You can see that the fibers over here are really small. In fact, uh, on this slide over here, we measured the diameter, the average diameter of the fiber over here, and it was about uh, 16 nanometers. So these fibers are really small. And now, comes the interesting part, 16 nanometers, if you, if you say that you have a fiber that's 16 nanometers, uh, the general public would not know what you're talking about. So we have a program where we have high school students come over to our lab and uh, we do the following experiment. So we do, we have them make a, make a polymer solution and then we have them take a sample of their hair. So this is an SEM image of a typical human hair and the diameter is about Anyway, it ranges from about 40 microns to about 100 microns. So the diameter over here, so if this is 50 microns, uh, this would be about uh, 40 microns over here. So if it's 40 microns and we talk of a fiber that's let's say 100 nanometers uh, in diameter, what that means is that the diameter of these fibers over here, you can get one of those fibers if you were to cut this hair along its length about a thousand times. So we are talking of something that's really very fine and something that can be produced in a matter of seconds in air at room temperature using the simple electrospinning technique. And so when you have a, a fiber that's, uh, that's 100 nanometers and you say, okay, that's a thousand times the smaller than your hair, then there is some idea of what a nanometer really means. Uh, so let's see, so the substrates I use to make my devices basically are commercially available substrates. Uh, over here you see on the left hand side a cartoon. It basically is a uh, silicon, uh, doped silicon. So this basically is, uh, you can treat this as a metal. And on top of this metal, uh, one grows silicon dioxide, basically is glass. So over here we have glass and over here we have a metal. So this is insulating and this is conducting. So the silicon dioxide, if you were to look at the vapor, this over here is the silicon dioxide. That's the top view, okay? And on the silicon vapor, which is about three inches, we can pre-pattern gold electrodes. So all of these squares that you see over here are gold electrodes that can be pre-patterned using lithography. And then this is a substrate on which I capture my fibers. So remember, to get a single fiber, I would take this substrate and then pass it very quickly in the space between the tip of the needle and the aluminum foil. And that's how, how I would get single fibers that will basically cross this substrate. And as they fall on the substrate, they are, base, they are flexible and they are charged. So when they impinge on the substrate, they stick. So here on the next slide, you can see several of these electrodes. So basically, if you were to zoom in, if you were to zoom in on any one of these uh, electrodes, what you would see would be something like that, or that, or that, okay? And you can see over here in this substrate, a single fiber, basically, that's cutting four electrodes, one, two, three, and four. Each of these electrodes are separated by this very tiny space in between. So we have basically four contacts to this fiber, and these pads over here, are fairly big that one can go ahead and put a probe station and then you could, for example, if you were to put a plus voltage over here and a negative voltage over here, then the current would flow in this finger all the way in this finger here, get into the fiber and then come out of this finger and go over here. Or if you were to put a voltage over here and over here, then the current would flow through this section of the fiber. So that becomes my active uh, region. Uh, similarly over here, on this slide over here, or on this slide over here, where you can see this is an SEM image and a higher magnification. But there's the fiber making contact with this cold electrode and this cold electrode. The contact resistance is not zero, but it's not very high. And I say it's not very high because if you were to look at the IV curve, the voltage current curve of this fiber, 
it would be omic. So, so what happens if you do not have, so what happens if you do not have the ability to make these electrodes, but you can get a wafer. So you can buy a wafer that does not have any of these electrodes. Well, you just go ahead and you spin your polymer and you capture your fiber on the top of this uh, substrate. And then if you wanted to put electrodes on it, for example, over here is the top of a substrate. And over here you can see two fibers that I have electrodes spun that basically intersect right over here, but there are no electrodes now. And you do not have any facility to do lithography. So here's a very simple technique. You get this TEM grid. So this is a transmission electron microscope grid, and they are commercially available in different sizes. So what you would do then is use this transmission TEM grid as a template. So let's say that you wanted to measure the current or the IV properties of this junction. So you would take this TEM grid and place it in such a way that you basically shield or you cover up this junction using this grid, okay? So that's a template and you have covered it with this grid and then you go ahead and evaporate your gold or silver and then you take the grid out. So when you take the grid out, you don't get any deposit of gold over here, but you do get a deposit of gold over here. And that's how we make our four connections to this uh, nanofiber. So there's no lithography. In fact, lithography would not work because these polymers are, are nanofibers, and if they come in contact with any solvent, it would just mechanically break them. So we use this uh, TEM grid as a template. Uh, once we have these gold electrodes at the ends of the fiber, then it becomes very simple to just put external contact and, uh, and do the electrical characterization. So the very simple device, the, the simplest device that you can think of is, uh, is a simple resistor. So here, for example, is an AFM image of one of these fibers going across, going across two electrodes. And as you can see from this height image of the, of the fiber, that's the height image from this point to this point. So from here to here, it's about 100 nanometers. So this fiber is about 100 nanometers in, in height. And here on the right-hand side, you can see what happens when you connect the fiber in this fashion. You put a voltage across the two leads and you measure the current. And you can see that it's, it's nice and ohmic. And from the from this curve, you can then calculate the resistance. Once you have the resistance uh, and you know the dimensions of the fiber, you can then extract uh, the conductivity. And there's more, there's more information in this, in this paper over here and several more experiments that you can do with undergraduate students uh, using this electrospinning technique. Uh, the same fiber, for example, over here, you can put it in a closed chamber where you can control the flow of gas over the fiber. And then that fiber basically becomes a chemi sensor. So it can sense gas. And here, for example, is a simple experiment where we have the resistance of the fiber as a function of time. So you apply a, a fixed voltage. Uh, you record the current. Uh, you calculate the resistance. And then you have the plot of the resistance as a function of time. And you can see that for a single fiber, OK, this is for a single fiber when you put nitrogen you decrease the resistance and you put methanol, you increase the resistance. If you had several fibers, okay, then you see that the response is a little bit, uh, the sensitivity is not that much. And that's because if you have a single fiber, a single fiber has a much higher surface area to volume ratio compared to a thin film or compared to several fibers. So there's one advantage to using single fibers. You get true saturation and, uh, and higher response. So these are basically two terminal devices. Uh, the other two terminal devices that students have made is, uh, is a Schottky diode. Now a diode is a device that allows current to flow in one direction, but does not allow current to flow in the other direction. And the simplest way to think of, a, or the simplest way to make a Schottky diode is to have an end doped semiconductor and a metal. So if you were to just take an end of semiconductor and touch a metal to it, you would form a short key barrier. And what happens at the interface over here, for example, is here is the Fermi level of the metal before contact. So you can see the space over here that indicates that the, the semiconductor and the metal 
are not touching each other, and the Fermi level of the metal is here, and we've taken a, a, an end doped or a metal over here, an end doped semiconductor here, but when you touch them together in thermal equilibrium, the Fermi levels have got to match. So if this level has got to match over here, then we have band bending. So this band necessarily has to bend, and that creates this barrier over here. So when you touch the metal to the semiconductor, electrons begin to flow from the semiconductor to the lower states in the metal, and that cannot continue forever, you get this barrier height. Okay, so you get this barrier being formed, and then depending on how you bias the device, you can have it in the reverse bias, so you have a higher barrier over here, so current would not flow, or you can forward bias it, and then the barrier height is reduced, and then you can, uh, you can get a flow of current. So the question becomes, how can one make a Schottky diode using just one polymer nanofiber? So that's the trick. Uh, it turns out to be very simple. You take one of these wafers, so you take an end doped so you start with an end doped substrate, okay, on which you pre-pattern your electrodes, and then you cleave it, you basically cleave it. And as you cleave it, you can see over here the top view of the cleaved edge of the substrate. Uh, that edge could cut through a gold electrode. So this is the gold electrode over here through which the silicon wafer has been cut. And then you go ahead and capture your single fibers. So here, for example, are two fibers. So you can even, uh, you can get a hit where you have just one fiber basically crossing the edge of this wafer. And that's where we have our short key diode. So we have one fiber making contact with the gold electrode on the top. And then if you look at the side view, you will see that the, the fiber, which is touching the gold over here on the top, once it crosses the edge, it touches the doped silicon beyond, below it. Remember that the, the silicon dioxide, the layer of silicon dioxide on the silicon, on the doped silicon vapor is about 200 nanometers, as you can see in this cartoon over here. So that is your silicon dioxide. Here's your gold electrode. Here's your electrospun fiber. It goes over the edge and makes contact right over here to the doped silicon which means that if you were to put a, pos a, a bias, a positive voltage to the gold electrode and a negative to the doped silicon, the only way you can get current to flow in this circuit is if current flows through this fiber and enters the doped silicon right over here. And that forms a short key diode, a point short key diode. And here are the device characteristics. So you see the, the the orange curve over here represents uh, a positive voltage being applied to the gold and the negative voltage being applied to the doped silicon. And the green curve has the, has the polarity reversed. So you see in one case the diode is forward biased in the first quadrant and in the second case it's biased in the third quadrant. And, uh, and then students basically uh, they go through the thermionic emission uh, model of a short key barrier and they are able to calculate uh, these ideal parameters, the barrier height, etc. So, very simple way to get uh, to get a short key uh, short key diode. And this is uh, one of the experiments that students do in in the senior lab. Uh, and since we have used it uh, on polyaniline, we can even use the same diode as a sensor. Because the diode, so you 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 can electrically characterize the diode in a vacuum. And then you put a little bit of ammonia, and ammonia basically begins to de-dope. It removes the conductivity of the polyaniline fiber, and the current decreases. And then you, you take the ammonia out, and then you can get it back uh, to the normal. It goes back, eventually it will go back over here. So you get a diode, which can also be used as a sensor, and that makes it uh, multifunctional. So that's another simple two-terminal device. Uh, here is a little more complicated uh, three-terminal device, also made from a single electrospun fiber. Uh, it's called a field effect transistor. And the polymer is this huge uh, name that uh, even I cannot pronounce, uh, as you can see over here. Uh, heat, uh, a polymer that uh, is commercially available, and it's a doped uh, N-type. Uh, the trademark is active ink. Uh, and the electrospun of fiber, so that's a single fiber. 
uh, with a grid, we then go ahead and put these two electrodes on it. So that would be this electrode and this electrode over here would correspond to this and this contact over here in this cartoon. And then we put a second voltage, which is called the gate voltage, and that gets connected to the doped silicon. Okay, so we have two batteries. Instead of having just one battery in the previous cases, we have two batteries. This is called the source drain, the source drain terminal of the FET, and this is called uh, the gate terminal. So then on this plot over here, what we have is we vary the drain source voltage, so you vary this battery over here, and then we measure the current in this fiber. So you measure the current in this fiber for different for different backgate voltages. So for different backgate voltages from 0 to 40 to 60 to 80. And you can see that each time we put a different voltage on the gate, we can increase the current in this channel over here. And that uh, is typical of uh, a field effect transistor that's doped in. So that's a little more complicated three terminal device. Uh, uh, the same polymer has a, has a response uh, in UV light, so we even look, looked at it as a sensor in UV radiation. And so this is a 355 nanometer UV lamp. And uh, here is the resistance as a function of time. So you've seen this plot before for polyanode. And once again, you see that uh, when you turn the UV on, the resistance decreases. And when you turn the UV off, the resistance increases. So there is a there is an effect with UV light, and this has to do with uh, with electronic transitions from the HOMO to the LUMO level of the polymer. But there is also, if you look at the FET of the device characteristics, you can see that at a fixed gate voltage of 30 volts, a fixed power of 70 volts, the moment you put UV, you basically increased the device current, which means that you have increased the transconductance of the device and you've improved on the mobility. And this has to do with uh, a UV creating an electron hole pair in the polymer. And then uh, basically the hole combines with any desorbed or adsorbed uh, species like oxygen and removes it from the system. So it basically releases an electron that can then contribute to the flow of current in the channel. Uh, here is another device that we have made, uh, but now it's, uh, it's crossed, okay? So this is a crossed tin oxide nanofiber crossed with a p-doped poly 3 hexyl pyrofine. So right over there you can see that if one of these fibers is doped N and the other fiber is doped P and you cross them over here like this, uh, you would get a PN junction. So to make this device, what we did is we took a substrate that had no, so this thing was not there, okay? There were no leaves on this substrate. It was a, a commercially available silicon, silicon dioxide substrate on which we deposited first the tin precursor, okay? So we electrospin the tin precursor and we capture one fiber, then we heat it up to about 70 cent, 700 centigrade and convert it to tin oxide. So then once the substrate is cold, we then go ahead and electrospin the P3HT polymer. And right over here, we have an intersection. So then I put this TEM grid, like I showed you before, that I covered up this intersection. And then I evaporated, in this case, gold. And I take the TEM grid off, and I have my four contacts. And here you can see are the silver paint. So uh, if you're careful, you need steady hands to make this, uh, to make these uh, contacts. Uh, you don't want a, a drop of silver paint that would cover up the junction because then that would spoil the device. So to make contact to this pad over here, it's best to start from, from this side over here and push on the paint so that eventually it touches this pad over here, which means that this contact is now a contact to this fiber. This contact over here it's contacting this gold electrode over here. It's contacting the silver, the tin oxide over here, etc. So you can then measure the P3HT tin oxide heterojunction right over here, etc. So here's a close-up of this uh, device. And so if you were to measure the current voltage curve from here to here, you should see rectification, or you should see a diode behavior. 
Nick, let me interrupt you with a question. Yeah. I'm sorry for the echo there. Here's the question. What about the fragility of these single fibers? What's their mechanical strength like? Are they, are they difficult to actually use as a practical sensor? Uh, the, the fibers, the single fibers, right, so they are fragile in the sense that once they, once they are applied to the substrate, then they basically stick and you cannot move them. But once you have contacts on the fiber and you're able to push a current through the fiber, then you can measure the current through this fiber in the presence of different gases. So as a sensor, it would not get damaged. So having a flow of gas over this would not uh, damage the fiber. But if you, if you wanted to move it uh, with a pin, uh, you would basically damage the fiber. So once it's produced, it's, it's solid. It, it's, it's in there. It's in there, right. OK, good. Thank you. Okay. Uh, on the next slide, what we have over here, basically, as you can see in this cartoon, where you have P3HT over here and, and tin oxide over here, for example, you can go ahead and, and electrically electrically characterize only the P3HT, so you put your leads only on this fiber over here, so there is no junction, or only on this one over here, and you have a FET, okay? So you have a, a, a gate, a source drain, and a current. And if you were to look at the curves, the yellow, the brown, and the red, which correspond to tin oxide, so that would be uh, tin oxide basically gets more conducting when you put 5 volts on the gate than when you put negative 5 volts on the gate. So tin oxide from this FET curve just shows shows you that it is an N-doped uh, semiconductor. On the other hand, if you were to look at P3HT, uh, you would go to these three curves over here, which basically, since it's P-doped, uh, it should be done in the third quadrant. And then you can see that for negative gate voltages, you have a higher current compared to positive gate voltage. So P3HT is P-type. So you have P-type, P3HT, N-type, SNO2, and let's see what happens when you go across the junction. So if you were to go across the junction, then you would get uh, what you would expect for a diode. Current in one, in one quadrant, and very little current in the other one. So if you were to switch the connection, the external connection, then you would get the diode behavior in the third quadrant. And here's basically uh, what happens at the junction where you have band bending and at thermal equilibrium, the Fermi level of tin oxide has got to match with uh, the Fermi level of the polymer. And that uh, gives you this uh, PN junction over here. And we were even able to test, uh, test this device in the presence of UV light uh, where you go from blue, you shine UV light, and you go, you take the UV light off and you come back to the green. So this is also reproducible. It's a device that also acts as a UV sensor. So let me go ahead and, and so here's again another type of a device where you have tin oxide, but now we have PE dot. Okay, PE dot is well, it's like a conduct, it's a conducting polymer that does not show any field effect like P3HT. So this can be, you can think of this as being a metal and this has been an endoped semiconductor. And once again, if you were to go from here to here, you'll basically get a Schottky diode. And that's exactly what we see over here. Uh, a Schottky diode, uh, over here is the, the nonlinear I. So here's the voltage and the current uh, of the device across a hetero junction. Uh, this curve over here only shows you that uh, the blue, the green, and the red correspond to the tin oxide arm of the device. So it's only tin oxide. So that's zero. That would be plus 40 volts, and that would be negative 40 volts. And that shows you that tin oxide is end doped once again. But if you look at PE dot, it basically stays ohmic no matter what the back gate voltage is. So the, so the curve, this, this curve, the voltage current flowing through the PE dot stays the same whether the back gate voltage is 40 volts or zero or negative 40 volts. So that does not show any field effect, whereas tin oxide shows you a field effect. And if you were to go across a heterojunction, you would get this, uh, 
you would get this uh, nonlinear diode-like behavior. In the presence of UV light, in this case, you see that the current increases uh, almost in the microampere range. And so what this uh, motivated me to do was, uh, if we have such a high current in this diode, in the presence of UV light, then I take this diode and I connect it in series with a simple resistor, and I apply a very a low frequency sine wave, basically this I think is about 100 hertz or 10 hertz, I, I'm not sure. But you see that the sine wave is applied at the entrance over here, and this voltage uh, across the resistor would be this blue one. It's not a perfect half wave rectifier, uh, but this, it does show some waveform clipping. So this very simple, a very simple device like this uh, can show you waveform clipping and showed you that one can use these, uh, the electrospinning technique to make all of these devices in air, by the way. So this is all done in air. So Puerto Rico is really very humid, and it doesn't seem to affect our devices. And as you can see, that uh, it's not very complicated to, to do this. Uh, the last slide I have over here now is uh, crossed. So now I have P3HT and PE dot, so you can make a uh, uh, go through various combinations of these conducting polymers. Uh, you electrospin, for example, the, the P3HT fiber first. So you first electrospin the P3HT fiber. Then you go ahead and you spin the PE dot fiber over it. And then you put your TEM grid and then you make these four contacts. So it's the same story. And then you can go ahead and, and once again electrically characterize these devices uh, as we've done before. And uh, here, for example, is the P3HT, which we've done before in the third quadrant. You can see that uh, the current uh, increases as you make the gate voltage uh, more and more negative. That's because it's, uh, it's a P-type device. And if you were to do, uh, so this over here is a little more complicated now. As you can see in this cartoon, there are three batteries now, you see? So one bat, so this over here, if you were to look at one, two, three, and four, basically it would be one, two, three, and four like that. And what we do in this experiment over here is that we have the drain source voltage connected to the P3HT fiber, okay? The PE dot fiber is basically connected to this other battery, which I call VTS. And then you have your regular gate, you have your regular gate battery over here. So we can control now, we can control the current flowing from two to four, either by controlling this battery and also by controlling that battery. And it turns out that when we put this battery over here, somehow we are able to improve the mobility of, uh, of charge by almost one order of magnitude uh, in this P3HT fiber. It has to do, I think, with uh, with some kind of uh, a heating effect over here that degasses that degasses any electron trapping species on this uh, on this fiber over here, and that basically what it does is it uh, so when it's zero, you have a barrier height. So this would be the contact, the gold making contact to the P3HT, and the gold making contact to the P3HT. That barrier height gets reduced, and so that improves the current, that improves the current. So it's the slopes basically of this curve over here, the slopes of these curves over here are slightly higher than the corresponding slopes of these curves over here. And that's what gives us this uh, increase in the mobility. So this, uh, I admit, this is a little complicated uh, circuit and, and I had to do this in the summer. Uh, during the semester, it could be really, very difficult. To, so that's uh, what I have uh, in, in, in my presentation. And to conclude, uh, all I would like to say is that uh, electrospinning is really a very simple technique. Uh, the power supply that we have, it's about $750 for the power supply, uh, but the rest uh, is really cheap. Uh, and with this simple technique, you can then make uh, fibers of any polymer. If a polymer has a the molecular weight is typically around 300,000 or more, then you can uh, make uh, polymer fibers without having to add another plasticizer polymer that has a slightly higher molecular weight. 
So you can make uh, fibers using the electro spinning technique. Uh, and I, I've shown you how we can use these fibers as sensors, diodes, field effect transistors. Some of these devices uh, are even multifunctional. And a lot of this, in fact, all of this work, except for the last one, was done by students, including high school students. Uh, we have a high school just across the street, and the students come over and they, they learn how to electro spin and undergraduates. Uh, and certainly, I would like to thank uh, the National Science Foundation and the Department of Defense for, for their financial support. So, thank you. Well, thank you, Nick. I hear, I hear an echo there. I hope that goes away. Thank you. You know, I've got a question for you, a couple of questions. I'm going to take you right back into your diagram. I'll, I'm going to move the slides back, so that's OK. Just a moment here. OK. So on this diagram, you know, it shows your experimental apparatus. Is it possible, this is one of the questions, to um, co-extrude polymers, you know, set up two different syringes and to co-extrude two different polymers? Have you ever done anything like that? Uh, people have done that now. <clears throat> the way they do it, uh, and I have not done it, but I just purchased uh, a, a, a needle. So they have two hypodermic needles, one inside the other. So it's called coaxial electro spinning. Is that what you're talking about? The coaxial one? Well, coaxial sounds like a good idea. I hadn't thought about that, but that does make sense because it would be driven by the same uh, plunger, so to speak. Right. So what you do is uh, you have two polymers. So the polymer that is being pushed out from the inner syringe has to be a little more, or the polymer that's the, one of them has to be more viscous than the other. And so when you do the electro sure. spinning, you get, so you get two different polymers that are coaxially electro spun. And then depending on what you need, you can put it in a solvent that would basically dissolve uh, the inner polymer. And then you would get uh, to use of these uh, of polymer, of the other, of the other polymer. I've not done it, uh, okay. but that's something I'll like okay. to do this summer. You know, on this slide here, we forgot to point out an important piece of the apparatus, which was the Maxwell House um, coffee box there. No, I'm just, I'm just, geez, I'm just <laughs> kidding about that. You know, do you do have another question that you mentioned in your talk, humidity? The um, and obviously, that's an issue. Do you attempt to control the humidity in your lab environment? One of our participants references an MIT paper on, on humidity there. And of course, in a high school lab, that might even be more difficult. Is that a big issue? The humidity is important, uh, especially when you're going to do sensor work. Now, to electro spin, we basically do it in air, as you can see on this slide over here. But once we uh, once we make a device, then uh, you're right. It's, it's important to control humidity because these, uh, the current flowing through these fibers uh, is very sensitive to the environment. In fact, if we have the fiber sitting on a table and somebody opens the lab door, then we can actually see the change in the current. So whenever I do my measurements, I typically put it in a vacuum. Uh, just an ordinary roughing pump vacuum of about 10 to the minus 2 torr. But uh, certainly, uh, humidity is important, and uh, and we don't have the apparatus to control humidity in our lab, unfortunately. OK. Now, um, Nick, I'm going to do one thing before we go to our final questions. Let me move forward here. I just want to, there we go. You know, we're supported by the National Science Foundation. I know you are, too, in your work, Nick. And we want to ask people to respond briefly to a survey that will help us improve these, um, these webinars and make them you know, provide more valuable for everybody. It also helps us to respond to the National Science Foundation when it says, what is our impact of what we're doing? So I'm going to launch that survey right now, everybody. And I'm sorry, it's just going to take me just a second to correct this operator error here that, we'll de that we're dealing with. Just a moment. OK, here we go. So for many of you, you'll see the survey come up on your screen. Just click those little radial boxes, and if you have a moment, 
tank, uh, you can type comments right in there. Nick, you mentioned you've done this with high school students. I mean, do they understand things like band gap? I mean, uh, or do you, you give them the information they need? How do you manage that? No, they don't know uh, about band gap, but they are, basically what they do is uh, when they come, so they do the simple experiment of electrospinning a polymer. It doesn't matter whether it's a conducting polymer or non-conducting polymer. And then they, they take uh, a sample of the hair, and then they measure the diameter of the hair and, uh, and, uh, and the fiber, and they compare that. So that is very simple. And then uh, some of them come and they, 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 they measure the, the resistance of the fiber as a function of uh, a, a gas flow on top of it. So they don't do the devices, but they do make uh, gas sensors. And so then they go ahead and they, okay. and they okay. measure the current increase and decrease, and then I show them how to calculate the relaxation and the recovery time and the sensitivity. So they are, right, the, other, the undergraduate students are basically involved in the diode and the FET. <laughs> Good. Well, thank you. Nick, look at the question in the chat window. I'm not sure I understand it exactly, but it says, how are we getting single or cross-linked nanofibers? Do we use different substrates? Okay. Do you understand I the question there? Uh, let's see. So we have, if you wanted a crossed fiber, okay, let's say that you wanted a crossed fiber of tin oxide, and then you want to cross it with uh, a polymer, say, PE dot. So what you do is you first prepare your tin oxide precursor solution, and then you do electrospinning on that solution. Okay, so basically you are electrospinning the tin oxide precursor. You then take a substrate, and then you pass it in the in the gap between the tip of the needle and the aluminum foil uh, quickly in the downward sweeping action, and then you capture on that substrate one or two fibers of this tin oxide precursor. You then take the substrate and then you heat it to about 700 degrees to convert it to tin oxide, right? So now you have the tin oxide fiber sitting on a substrate. And that's taken out of the oven and it's cold. You go ahead and you set up the electrospinning apparatus for PE dot. So you're now going to spin PE dot. And you take the same substrate and then you go and you pass it in the, in the space between the tip of the needle and the, subst and the aluminum foil and you capture some PE dot fibers. And wherever you have a PE dot fiber intersecting with a tin oxide fiber, you then go ahead and put your PEM grid, and then you can make, make your device. I'm not sure if that, uh, if that answered your question. Well, good. I think that's fine, actually. We have one more question. Before I do, I'm just going to close the survey, folks. I hope. Uh, You've had a chance to click on the radio buttons, so I'll give you a countdown. Please go ahead and submit, hit that submit button in five, four, three, two, one. Now, folks, as we get to our last question, I want to remind you that you can access the recording and slides by just going to nanoforme.org slash webinars. Nick, uh, another question. Do you monitor the current while electrospinning these conducting polymers? Is that something you do? Do you monitor that current? The current uh, coming out of the power supply is really very small. Uh, we do not monitor, monitor the current, uh, but it's typically uh, in, the, in, the, in the nanoampere or even picoampere range. Yeah. Okay. So to get a current, you would need to have a complete path between the tip of the needle a polymer making contact to the aluminum foil, which typically does not happen because typically the fiber breaks in, in between. Yeah. So the current is very small. Okay. One other question, Nick. Does your, your group or groups you know of, do they make nanocomposite fibers by, by maybe uh, mixing the composite components in the solution and then spinning it? Do they do that? Now, uh, there is a group, uh, Dabo Renica, at the University of Akron. So he might be uh, into composite polymers. Even uh, Gregory Rutfield in uh, Rutledge in MIT. I think those are the two groups that, uh, that work a lot on electrospinning. So they okay. might be doing uh, some of those precursors. All right, we'll check that out. You know, Nick, uh, you're perfectly on time. It's just been such an interesting approach today. 
everyone I think was impressed by potentially how simple this is and yet the applications to sensors and as you mentioned tissue scaffolding very fascinating. I'd like to let people know that if they attended this webinar, which was just an hour today, not 1.5 hours, and you'd like a certificate of participation, go ahead and email Sue Barger at engr.psu.edu. You can see it right there on the screen. Now, coming up in the NAC network on August 11th is a workshop a physical, hands on workshop titled Nanotechnology Course Resources 2 with a focus on patterning, characterization, and applications. So that's in August. A little bit sooner are two conferences, June 4 through 6, the Micro Nanotechnology Conference in Albuquerque, and the famous High Tech Conference in Chicago, July 21 through 24. That High Tech Conference last year attracted people from 43 states and seven countries around the world. So it's a great event. You can Google High Tech the High Tech Conference 2014. Nick, I just wanted to personally thank you for the, uh, your presentation today. I really appreciate your logging in uh, in the busy of your finals week. I'm sure your students are going crazy down there. Well, not crazy, but we appreciate your doing that. And uh, we appreciate the, form the informative presentation. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you, Nick. There was one question uh, about placing the uh, the certificate connection. Bob, would you put that in the chat window, Sue Barger's email? Could you put that in, Bob? Thanks very much. So everyone, that officially ends our presentation today. Nick, this will conclude. You can just go ahead and log off of the system. Thank you again for uh, everyone for being part of today's webinar. Goodbye.